Hello everybody and thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first in our series of webinars, our Greening Algeria's Campuses webinars. My name is Orlando Edwards and I'm the director of the British Council Algeria. The British Council is the UK's International Organisation for Cultural Relations. We work to build relationships between people and institutions in the UK and Algeria through programmes and events in the areas of education, English and the arts. Today, in the lead up to the next UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties meeting, also known as COP26, which takes place in Glasgow in Scotland in November this year, we are launching the first webinar of our Greening Algeria's Campuses series which are part of a project to raise awareness of climate change issues and to inspire Algerian students to take action to make their campuses greener. Looking after the planet is a human rights issue. It's a health issue, a gender equality issue, a racial equality issue, a development issue, a displacement issue, a peace and a security issue, and it's a survival issue. We hope that this project will result in benefits to everyone living in Algeria and that it will lead to stronger relations and more collaboration with students and universities in the UK. There's a word that comes to mind when doing this. I first heard as the title of an environmental documentary made almost 30 years ago, back before many of us had even heard the phrase climate change. And I suspect back before many of you watching were born. That word is Koyanikatsi, it's Hopi Indian. The Hopi are a Native American tribe who mostly now live in Northern Arizona. And Koyanikatsi has many meanings, including crazy life and life out of balance. But the one that struck me was a way of life that calls for another way of living. A way of life that calls for another way of living, isn't that unarguably where we are now. That's why with these webinars, the goal isn't just to look, to go back over how we got here and who is to blame, but to look ahead and identify those other ways of living which give us the best chance of navigating our way from where we are to where we need to be. And by us, although I mean all of us, because climate change is a global issue, for these webinars, we're focusing on Algeria and in particular, its universities and the students and staff within them. What can they do? What can you do that will be most effective in mitigating or even undoing the damage we've already done to our environment? As I'm hoping you've gathered, all six of the webinars in this series are under the umbrella of the title Greening Algeria's Campuses, but each one will come at the challenge from a different perspective. Over the weeks ahead, we'll concentrate on waste, on cities, on food, biodiversity and practical collaboration. But we're starting today with energy. Clearly changing which sources of energy we depend on, the quantities we use and the irreplaceable resources we destroy in the process is critical to our long term survival as a species. Don't think there's much argument about it. But bearing in mind that Algeria not only is the largest country in Africa, but right at the top for energy consumption and reliance on fossil fuels, what impact can students and universities here have on cutting emissions, identifying and harnessing cleaner forms of energy sources and all other aspects of being resourceful about our resources? That's what we're here to help identify. Um, I work in the part of the University at Edinburgh, which we call Corporate Services Group. And so these are our services that support our research and our teaching. And the department I work in sits alongside our estates, our accommodation services, our health and safety. We're a small department, but we work with others to embed and integrate sustainability across the organisation. We need to make sure sustainability isn't a silo, but is mainstreamed across our strategies and priorities. So energy, that's our topic here for today. And that's been one of our biggest issues that we've been working on at the University of Edinburgh. Our university carries out groundbreaking research into renewable energy and supports learning into innovative uh, programs. But we are also a large organization. 
we have over 500 buildings um, in Edinburgh, in Scotland. And as a large research intensive university, we use a lot of energy. Scotland is not known for its warm uh, climate, so we also need a lot of heat uh, to keep our students and staff warm in the winter months. And of course, energy has a big environmental and social impact. Greenhouse gas emissions from our use of energy is significant at our university. In 2016, we set out our climate strategy to reduce our carbon footprint with interim targets to 2025 and to be net zero carbon by 2040. About 30% of our energy needs currently comes from the electricity grid. We benefit from being in Scotland and having grid electricity that is reducing in its carbon intensity year on year. Back in 2009, only about 30% of Scotland's electricity came from renewable energy sources, but by 2020, it was over 90%. We use electricity from the grid and we're also finding opportunities on our own sites to have renewable energy. Um, we're just about to complete a solar farm. There is sunshine sometimes in Scotland um, at our Easter Bush campus. And we also have solar panels on some of our buildings and on some of our roofs. But we're in a UNESCO World Heritage Site and so urban windmills aren't really an option for us, despite it being a very windy country here. Um, but we're looking at other options. But a significant portion of our energy um, comes from our combined heat and power systems. So these are gas fired generators. It's about 60% of our energy it comes from our CHPs and they are connected by a series of pipes underneath our campuses distributing heat. Um, and in the past, these CHP centers contributed to reducing our carbon, but as they're gas fired, um, they're now more carbon intensive than the grid. And so it's a different story and a real key challenge for us in um, Edinburgh and in Scotland, as well as in the wider UK, um, is the decarbonisation of our heat. And this isn't an easy challenge. And we're doing work now looking at the options and the pathways. We've invested a lot in energy efficiency. Five years ago, we set up a sustainable campus fund, and this was to um, support harnessing the innovation and creativity of our students and of our staff to come up with ideas and projects that would help to save energy, that would help save carbon, and that also have a financial um, return. And we're also doing work on our new building design and on old buildings when we move back into, into campuses um, and also thinking about how we any steps we need to take to adapt to obviously the changes that climate change will bring. But of course, we also recognize the wider influence, our indirect impacts on energy and on energy systems through the things that we buy and the organizations that we've in, invested in. We've taken a whole organization approach and off the back of a lot of student activism and also involvement from student and staff community, um, our investment committee has made a, made a decision to divest from uh, fossil fuels, um, originally coal and tar sands and then oil and gas. We have a large um, endowment fund which invests in companies. So we've thought kind of the whole systems approach as well. And of course, this talk is about energy. Um, an approach we've taken is not just the technical aspects of energy, but to find ways to really harness the energy of our students and of our staff and to work with partners. We have a network of about 500 sustainability champions around the university, and we're supporting projects which try to see our, our university as a living laboratory, where students as part of their studies could work on projects related to energy challenges whether that's working with engineering students on more technical aspects or working with sociology students on behavior change and organizational change. We need to harness the energy of our students and of our staff and work with partners locally and globally. So some progress has been made, but we have a long way to go. And obviously uh, decarbonizing our energy is critical to achieving global greenhouse gas reductions. And we know that addressing climate change is one of the biggest challenges of our time. And this requires research, it requires innovation, it requires collaboration, and it requires partnership, big thinking and big ideas. And we believe universities can and should be leading the way. So it's no longer a why for us, but a how. And we know that the how isn't easy, but we also know what needs to get done and we're working on how to get there. I think I'd like to start with some more general thoughts first. Uh, clearly, climate change is a global issue of ever increasing importance. That's why um, we're all here and it requires immediate action and planning. Currently, Algeria's nationally determined contribution, which is essentially their goal for reduction with regards to their greenhouse gas emissions, is a 7% reduction by 2030, and that could rise up to 22% with international support. At least that's what the target currently is. 
And I think that fundamentally, and this is very much a global issue, we need more ambition. And universities are uniquely positioned with scientists, policymakers, and social experts that can influence the national level of ambition and lobby for stronger targets. Now, that's easy to say, but much harder to put in practice. So I think a good first step is for universities to set ambitious net zero targets of their own, both long term scope three goals and also interim scope one and two goals and then back those targets with robust plans for climate action, something that we've seen an increasing number of universities in the UK do. And undoubtedly, energy will play a big part in these plans. And I can speak for the university that I studied at, the University of Warwick. It was actually students that in the first place pushed um, the university to, to set uh, the target um, of net zero for 2030 for scopes one and two and, and net zero for 2050 for scopes three um, and so i think that's kind of that leads into what i what i feel is my next point which is that we need to see students pushing to have a stronger voice within their institution because i think there's a lot of power to to drive that passion in a way that really results in action and I think that comes in, in two parts. We need to see students pushing to have that stronger voice, but also need to see universities actively seeking out students and creating that opportunity to have them engage in discussions that are of significance at the institutional level and for students to become practitioners of that sustainability agenda. So I think one example of uh, a way that universities can support is by creating sustainability related internships within universities as well as supporting student societies and forums where students can cultivate their knowledge and direct their passions. I know again speaking from experience for me it was a really big deal to just be able to meet other students who were also interested in some of the same things I was but also to expand my horizons beyond just those things that I knew about to begin with and I think above all it's important that the syllabuses that taught that our students, um, the syllabuses that are taught to our students, that they're updated to reflect the changing needs of skills and expertise in the world. We're seeing that growing shift away from fossil fuel based production towards more sustainable activities, though of course Algeria does have a natural endowment for oil and gas. But we need to ensure that graduates walk away with that transferable and relevant set of skills which will last for a good part of their lifetime. So, yeah, I, I, th I think that there are, that, that's, that's kind of the more generalist perspective, but on a, on a kind of, you know, kind of continuing, I think it's clear that universities need to plan ahead for uncertainty. We've got a warming climate that, of course, means more frequent and severe extreme weather conditions. And with Algeria um, placed in North Africa, just the, the proximity of droughts is a, a, clearly a primary concern. And so resilient electricity infrastructure is going to be important, as well as greater amounts of heating and cooling infrastructure. And on the latter, I think that it's important that we are aware of cooling equipment um, that requires usage of refrigerant gases, which also happen to be greenhouse gases. So it's important that we have clean cooling systems that minimize those emissions. And Regarding energy usage, it's important to measure energy usage and performance because you can't track what you don't measure. So a really quick and easy step that I think uh, can kind of go alongside that measuring of energy usage is to educate staff and students about their behavior and how that affects energy use on campus and in student residences. We've seen so at, at the University of Warwick, one initiative that was conducted by a student led organization called our Behavioral Insights Team, where so like a, a bunch of students that study behavioral economics and uh, behavioral sciences, they installed uh, essentially a two part sticker on a light switch where it was in the shape of a heart. And when the light switch was on, then the heart was broken because, well, of course, the part of the light switch is, is pushed away. But when the light switch is off, then the sticker is kind of brought together. And so that alongside signs next to the lights, as well as next to computers, 
resulted in really a huge reduction in uh, energy usage, 30 to 40 percent of electricity use in these buildings, which I just found astounding. So I think that's an example of a low cost but effective way of uh, reducing energy usage. On a bigger scale, clearly investment grade, um, we need to install energy efficient models of equipment and source equipment from suppliers that provide you know, the type of life cycle analysis that support um, decisions uh, that are informed in the first place. That's energy use. So I can say lastly on kind of energy generation, um, we've seen an example of in the UK, an example of a uh, purchase power agreement, a, a sector wide partnership with 20 British universities in 2019 that struck a deal to source clean renewable energy direct from a national portfolio of wind farms and letting them pay a fixed price whilst also guaranteeing those wind farms a source of income. So now you, you some of you will know far more than me um, about Algeria's policies, but I think that one of them is to support their target um, for reaching 27% of total electricity generation by 2050 from renewables is a tender scheme to support purchase power agreements for solar energy. So I think there is a precedent for these deals at a corporate and a municipal level, but and certainly there is an opportunity to use this scheme. Uh, but our next speaker, who knows far more than me about the national specifics of an energy transition, will elaborate further on this topic. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the landscape of the renewable energy market in Algeria is here. You can see that uh, uh, we tested the technology from uh, uh, what we call the concentrated solar power plant, uh, photovoltaic, uh, wind, and you have here the, 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 the development or what we call the, the program initiated from uh, uh, since 2011 and 2015 and uh, 2020. And there that you can see that um, the program uh, launched in 2011 uh, was modified uh, two times but at the end of the day that we can see that uh, uh, now we have only uh, low uh, um, uh, around 500 megawatt installed in Algeria and uh, this is uh, uh, the big question why Algeria with uh, plenty of uh, uh, solar and wind is not able to develop this kind of uh, technologies. This is mainly because uh, in Algeria all the energy is produced uh, uh, using gas in, and you can see that uh, since uh, 2000, 2000 uh, the government and uh, the state engaged uh, uh, a big uh, huge quantity of money to install uh, new capacity mainly using uh, gas and uh, now in 2020 we have around 22,000 megawatt uh, installed capacity which is uh, corresponding to 96 98 percent of the total capacity installed in Algeria. We can see that uh, this uh, situation of using uh, a, a huge quantity of gas is not uh, sustainable because uh, we can see that uh, maybe since 2006-2007 we see that the, the export quantity of gas is declining because we have now a new uh, huge uh, usage of energy mainly represented by the, 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 the consumers. Now what we see that uh, we, ca we consider that the country will face a uh, big challenge in the near fu future uh, where a conventional natural gas is fa facing a structural decline since 2006-2007. Uh, this is complicated by the, the total the local demand which uh, grow at a rate of 5 to 7 percent per year which is very uh, impressive compared to uh, European countries but not uh, when compared to countries in the MENA region or in Africa. So uh, the question now is how we can modify this. We can see that uh, since uh, January 2020, the government now is uh, uh, preparing a, a program and uh, 
a new way to change this situation, mainly by organizing the sector. Uh, this is uh, done through the, 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 the setting up uh, a new ministry called the Minister de la Transition Energétique et des Energies Renouvelables. And the, this uh, new minister now is in charge to uh, go with the new uh, policy in order to diversify the, the economy, the reduction of the dependency from hydrocarbons. Uh, what uh, if we want to summarize uh, what uh, the government is uh, is doing now? We have uh, two important uh, things uh, to, to to say. The first that the government the, the government is now has the this. Um, uh, intend to, to establish a local industry and also to develop uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency programs. This is the, the first thing. The second thing that the setting up a new ministry is an important thing in order uh, to develop this uh, program. And we think that in 2021, uh, we can see uh, few uh, or uh, results uh, uh, on, the, um, on the ground. Uh, but uh, we have a uh, third point, which is uh, a hope, which is the, that we expect that the government will uh, really uh, launch this program and, uh, uh, or, and uh, realize the, the projected uh, uh, the projects that uh, he announced. So we think that uh, time to act is now. Thank you very much. Some call me nature. Others call me mother nature. I've been here for over four and a half billion years. 22,500 times longer than you. I don't really need people, but people need me. Yes, your future depends on me. When I thrive, you thrive. When I falter, you falter. Or worse. But I've been here for eons. I have fed species greater than you, and I have starved species greater than you my oceans, my soil, my flowing streams, my forests. They all can take you or leave you. How you choose to live each day, whether you regard or disregard me, doesn't really matter to me. One way or the other, your actions will determine your fate, not mine. I am nature. I will go on. I am prepared to evolve. Are you? So my first point, really, before I get to my three other other points. My first point is never tire of showing people why this issue is so important. I've been working in sustainability for decades and I never tire of reminding myself and reminding other people how important it is. And videos like that, and there's loads more on YouTube and on the internet in other places, they really tell the story, I think, powerfully. Never underestimate the power of a short video in trying to spread the message in greening Algeria's campuses. So three other things briefly. First of all, leadership. It's really important for students to engage with senior leaders. Now I say senior leaders and, and they're important because they have lots of money and lots of um, say in what goes on, but actually Distributed leadership is important. So there are leaders at every level in your organization. And it's just as important to engage those as well as the senior leaders. 
You can do that in lots of different ways, either directly. I mean, my door is open, my email is available for students, so you can engage directly with people, with senior people. Or you can do it perhaps through your student unions or equivalent. At Winchester, we have a student sustainability society. And um, as, as the chief executive of the university, I take that society very seriously and I talk to its president all the time. Um, so there are lots of ways of engaging with senior leaders, but don't underestimate how important it is to do that. That was my first point. So the second one is to say just briefly about the Climate Commission, the UK Climate Commission for Higher and Further Education. This is an example of what can happen when students engage with senior leaders. So Manvia, who you've heard from already, and myself are two co-chairs of the commission. And we're working hard on lots of different issues. Um, students, leaders working hand in hand. And one uh, significant output is a toolkit for higher education. And perhaps that's something that we can share with you and your institutions. And the third thing I wanted to say is a little bit about what we've done at my own institution. So we've been here since 1840, and I think there's always been an interest in harmony with nature. And we call ourselves now the University for Sustainability and Social Justice. This is Winchester University. We declared a climate emergency a long time ago and we seek to be carbon neutral by 2025. So there's lots of things going on. I'm just going to pick out one or two to mention to you. So first of all, visual material on the campus. That's important, not just visual material on, uh, on the internet or on phones, but actually old fashioned visual material. So we're about in a few days time to put up the first full size statue of Greta Thunberg anywhere in the world. And it's a bronze statue we commissioned and it's there to inspire students, but staff as well and the general public. And we hope it will do that. So don't underestimate the effect of visual phenomena. Campaign, my next one, campaign for all sorts of things. So for buildings to be carbon neutral, be aware a lot of the carbon emissions from buildings over the lifetime of the building are actually involved in the construction phase up to, can you believe this, 50% of the carbon emissions of a building this whole lifetime, including the energy and maintenance and running costs, all of that up to 50% is in the construction. So actually that's made us change what we do from um, having building lots of new buildings and we still build some and they're all carbon neutral and sustainable, but we are repurposing and reusing buildings wherever possible. Next, we meter like crazy. Manvia talked about metering and others have. Um, we, we campaign for meters all over the place so that you know how much energy is being used. And lastly, from me, staff and student engagement. Now we've got all sorts of crazy student engagement initiatives and I'll tell you the names of some of them. So one of them is called the Student Switch Off Campaign. This is an energy competition or halls of residence for the best performing student houses and they uh, received prizes. One year they received a year's supply of ice cream. Another year they received ball tickets. Uh, another one uh, is called Blackout. So student volunteers work with staff um, and switch off the necessary equipment around the university to see how much can be saved over a weekend. And we also do something called Burger Off and Pizza for Power, which are competitions rewarding students with sustainable food for switching off and saving energy. And my last point then is free food works really well. And it's not just for students, that works well for staff as well. If you're thinking, well, today's uh, discussion was fascinating and um, that's uh, really got me thinking about creating a brighter, greener future. I got a real sense of how each of us in Algeria and beyond can play a part in changing the energy we use. But 
why didn't they talk more about aspects like cities, food, biodiversity, waste and practical collaboration? Well, the good news then is that these are the topics which we're going to focus on in the remaining five webinars in this series.